You are listening to Joygasm, a video game and movie podcast. I'm Russ, Xbox Live Toaster 360. He is Steve, Xbox Live Stevovich, and our eyes are black from drinking too many potions in episode 157 today, January 25th, 2020. We're going to catch up with each other before we're going to dive right into our analysis of the Netflix Witcher Season 1 show that's been going on. And I know that Steve has been chomping at the bit to be able to get into this. And I, for one, am very interested to hear what he has to say about it, seeing as how he is the resident Witcher expert. So, Steve, how you doing? Ah, it's been a good day so far, Russ. I will tell you, I actually got some sleep, didn't wake up this time, didn't wake up hungry, didn't wake up with my mind running 100 miles an hour trying to figure out uh, quantum physics, you know? W- wife didn't ki- you know, ninja kick you in the <laughs> squiggly spooge? Actually, no, but when I ju- she went to bed before I did, and I jumped into bed last night, and her she was starfish sleeping, um, <laughs> which basically means that uh, when I jumped in... Um, her leg was uh, was sticking out all the way on my end, and I landed on it. So um, that kind of woke her up. Unfortunately, we're still working it out, Russ. You know, I don't worry. You'll heal in the morning. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it'll grow back. Don't worry. <laughs> so <laughs> I thought the knee bent the other way. Yeah. So um, anyhow. Uh, so no, yeah, it's it's been great. We had an awesome breakfast. We made we made ourselves some some crispy bacon and some flapjack protein pancakes and some eggs using your recipe. I might add, Rose. My um, recipe, a eh? well, <laughs> you are wise to do so. <laughs> and I will say, uh, if you haven't had hot sauce on your eggs, put hot sauce on your eggs. Well, Either see, Tabasco you put hot sauce on a lot or- of things. I'm just saying, I'm just saying, uh, Tabasco and Sriracha are magical on eggs. That's all I want to say. Uh Uh-huh. Well, that's good, Steve. Yeah. So, anyhow, I, uh, I, you know, I watched, (laughs) you're going to laugh at me. I'm laughing at myself, actually. But, you know, I watched. Pretty women. I I mentioned this (laughs) last episode, but I, I, I rented. Uh, and had now watched as of last night the never ending story, which I'm not I gonna laugh at you about that. That's a classic, watched, it's a classic, but I'm telling you, I think it should remain as a classic back in that time. Um, because I when well, I watched it again last night, it was not nearly as entertaining. The story is still good, but it was not nearly entertaining as it once was. You know, you can watch some movies like you know, The Secret of Nymph. Uh, or a flight and navigator, and they retain all their story quality from years past. But this one, mm, I think I just would have rather enjoyed it, left it at a, as a good memory on the shelf, and uh, left it there. <laughs> you know what I mean? It is one of those <laughs> quintessential the- like '80s classic movies. Well, it is, but the story just doesn't hold weight. Kind of, I mean. The uh, the the main character just kind of goes on a quest and talks to some random beasts who you know are robotic. Of course, you know they had to use the practical effects of the time, which are still kind of cool. But uh, nothing really just happens. Just kind of goes and hey, I need to prevent this from happening. Hey, I need to prevent this from happening. Hey, I need to. Pre- <laughs> and he doesn't do anything. He just kind of it's just kind of this like melodramatic quest throughout the whole movie. <laughs> I really got bored. I'm just saying. <sighs> Yeah, yeah. Well, and it's interesting because that was one of the two major films that were based on the idea that someone was reading a book. And I right. think in uh, in the Never Ending Story, I think the, doesn't the boy actually get sucked into the book? Well, he does and he doesn't. It's like he he makes he he makes the book into his reality. So okay. he doesn't get sucked in necessarily, but like towards the end, um, like the the nothing happens, which is basically kids' imaginations. Um, that are, are not as wild and exploratory as they, you know, as they were, maybe because the kids are growing up, I'm not sure. They do hearken to uh, too many kids playing video games, and that's why kids don't have imagination, which I 
almost spat at the TV screen for that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Throwing tomatoes that she's the TV. <laughs> ah! Heresy! <laughs> so, and he, I was like, I'm thinking like, you know, because we read these books, like people like us have made these critically acclaimed and pieces of art video games, you know, because of these imaginations anyway, and inspired other generations to do so. Anyway, so... Uh, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not saying we as in me, I'm saying we as the video game community. So anyhow, um, the, the nothing happens. And it, as the child is reading the story, he gets the impression that they are talking to him. Like he needs to, to imagine the, the young empress's last name to, to keep this world of Fantasia alive. And so the kid basically, um, yells out her name or name it. He made up for her. And all of a sudden, um, he meets with her in his, I guess, imagination or something. I'm not really sure. Uh, but she keeps Fantasia alive. She gives the last piece of Fantasia that, quote unquote, the nothing didn't uh, didn't uh, totally eviscerate. And so when he gets back into the real world, um, he, he has his handy dandy luck dragon with him. And is able to scare the bullies who uh, tossed him in a trash can in the beginning. That's right. I forgot yeah. about that. Yeah. And so um, then he lives on his happily merry life. Yeah. It's very different from um, The Princess Bride. Yes. The Princess Bride is, is I think, a far superior piece of... Uh, pop culture, 80s oh, yeah. classic goodness. But at the same time, though, you know, I do think that the never ending story does have certain qualities about it for its time. I do think that especially considering that there really aren't all that many fantasy oriented movies um, and, and the eighties, like, like they were kind of drenched more in that almost like cheesy fantasy, not you know, like, like when Lord of the Rings came out, it was actually very accessible to the masses when they went and saw the, the, the films. And if I compare it to something like the never ending story, I mean that is way more deep into the, 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 the fantasy genre that I think may alienate some viewers. But having said that though, I was always a fan of it. I, I always felt so terrible for the horse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. In the beginning, I was yeah. like, man, that sucks. Like poor horse. Like what a way to start it. Yeah. 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 I was like, man, this, this is, and especially cause I saw it when I was like, seven years old or something. I mean, I was like terrified. I just felt so bad for the horse, but I remember, I remember that scene and I remember the wolf creature thing that was always like in the shadows watching the, the, the boy walking with his glowing eyes. And then I, I think I remember there was another scene too, where like he was, he was like walking toward, they're like these huge statues or something. And like, he was walking towards some gateway and like, if he didn't have the right thing or if he wasn't the right person or something like that, that uh, like laser beams would like disintegrate whoever it was walking through or what? what yeah. It's been too long so, since I've seen it. Yeah, basically. Okay. I'll, I'll describe what happens for you, Russ. Okay. So basically what happened is he uh, he's sinking in, in this marsh uh, because he loses all hope. He goes to see this wise um being, which is, which is a huge turtle in a sense, the turtle that's like sneezing on him constantly. And, um, and so the turtle says like, yeah, you can go see this mystical person, uh, because I don't have the answer, but that person's 10,000 miles away. And so, uh, our main character basically says, okay, well, that's way too far for me to travel. I mean, uh, the world is disintegrating and uh, I need to see him now. And so he loses all hope and he starts to sink in the marsh. The marsh will sink you faster if you're losing hope versus if you're uh, just totally stoked and happy and full of courage. And, you know, then you weren't, you're not going to sink. And so uh, the luck dragon, Falcorn, uh, comes out of nowhere, out of the clouds, picks him up, carries him off and into his little kind of lair where he meets with some other kind of small creatures who um, tell him the gateway to get to this mystical creature, he has to pass these kind of sphinx-looking creatures who, if you don't have the courage in yourself, they'll they'll pick that out and um, laser beams will shoot out of their eyes and, and uh, kill you. <laughs> and so this knight uh, goes before uh, our hero here and uh, he doesn't have the courage and gets too nervous and they, they kill him. 
And so anyway, um, that's basically the scene. And he was, and our main character is able to uh, run right past and not get hurt and continue on his merry way. Well, yeah, hearing you talk like that, it does remind me of, uh, the, I remember that the, the, yeah, the turtle with the, uh, the, the snot problem. I remember that the sneezing or something like that. That was pretty. Yeah. Funny. <laughs> um, I watched that when I was in the, th- no late, no later than the third grade, maybe even second grade, but that yeah, we were both that. in elementary school when yeah. we saw it. Yeah. It was a while ago, Raj. It was, it was a while ago. Well, I think it's cool that you still made a point to watch it. And, and even though it hasn't uh, aged well necessarily, aren't they like kind of talking about having a, a reboot of that movie may be made? I thought they were like, I remember like a couple of years ago, they were thinking of, of um, rebooting that. And I'm not sure what happened. I know they re Netflix made uh, the, the dark crystal series. Yes. But I don't know what happened to the never ending story. You know, I was thinking there was another one that I, we watched when we were kids and it was almost like the the Wizard of Oz, but like a scarier version of the Wizard of Oz. Yet still it was a kid. sequel. It was it was it was the return to Oz, I think is what it was called. Is that what the, it was called? Yeah, the ones that had those like terrifying wheelers. Yes, the wheelers. That's what I've been I've been thinking about that ever since I watched this movie. I'm like, what was that other movie? Because I remember the rock creature in this movie I thought was part of that movie. <laughs> but but when I was all, I was expecting to see the wheelers and then they never came. And I thought, okay, I'm getting kind of close to the end of the movie here. I think I would see the wheelers and I never saw them. But anyhow, I'm gonna have to uh I, I wanna see that one again too. I'll have to put that one on the list. Well, and that movie was just <sighs> was it, it was, it was I remember it being weird. It was, oh my goodness, it was a complete departure from The Wizard of Oz. I mean, The Wizard of Oz was just this classic cinema tale that just, it stands at a test of time and, and, and it's, it's filled with hope and positivity. And you do have some some uh, little intense moments with the Wicked Witch. But uh, overall, I mean, it, it's more of a lighthearted, uh, filled with songs kind of movie. Return to Oz is a complete and utter departure where... I don't even think there was any kind of singing whatsoever. And we come to find out that like all these horrible things were happening in the land of Oz after Dorothy left and um, how like when she left her Ruby slippers fell onto some, I think it was like some mountain King or rock King or something who like basically like twisted everything around and people were getting tortured. And I mean, it was, it was literally like if, if we were around a campfire and someone was telling a story like like the first movie version of the story that was filled with like song and laughter and and whimsical qualities and stuff. And then it was the, the next person who was sitting on the tree stump next to the first person's turn to take the story and run with it. And he told like he or she would just totally <laughs> go down this other rabbit hole that like made it completely twisted and creepy and just. Man, I think I had nightmares when I was a kid when I watched that. It was so <laughs> yeah. weird. I, I think I did too, honestly, but I, I don't know why I'm curious about it again. Didn't Disney make it? I don't know if Disney made it or if they distributed it. Um, I want to say that there it was a British company that actually made the film. Um, I'll, you know, we'll have to IMDB it. You should IMDB it while we're talking about it, honestly, just to, to see, but... Yeah, I can't recall if it was something that was pushed by Disney or if it was someone else entirely. Um, yeah, my goodness. Yeah, that whole thing. I mean, it was so, I was so unprepared. I remember that as a child, just thinking, oh, we're going to see the Cowardly Lion and the Tin Man and the Scarecrow again. And you get in there and we're like, what the heck happened? You know, you're, you're completely <laughs> just... Caught <laughs> off guard. You're not equipped at all to be able to anticipate what the heck is going to happen. I mean, I think the wheelers came in during the first like 10 minutes of the movie. I'm like, okay, yeah, I'm having nightmares tonight. <laughs> yeah. It says Walt Disney Pictures Return to Oz. I don't know. Maybe anyway. they were, uh, yeah, that, I, I don't know. <laughs> I, could just, I could just see them around some kind of 
I don't know, pitch desk, you know, a table where like, like you have like some creatives giving a pitch and they're like, I got this great idea. So imagine Oz, you know, they're all used to seeing it this way where it's like, it's happy and, you know, gumdrop smiles. Forget all that. How about we make it a living hell when all the creatures that you come to know and love, all the beloved creatures are just in agony. How about that? And you're like, well, uh, I appreciate your progressive vision. Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. <laughs> so have you been playing anything? No, well, I'm making my way still for Star Wars. Um I uh man, I, there's this part I, I can't stand it. There so I where what planet am I on? I forgot. I can't remember the names of the planets, but this is the part where I can't stand the platform jumping aspect where uh something what happened? I think I was I, I were I got to a new planet where there's kind of like these messed up zombie looking creatures um, that have glowing, glowing eyes. You got to have the glowing eyes. Yeah, I know. Anyhow, there, and then there's like this brotherhood and one of these guys picks up a boulder and throws it down on the platform where I'm standing and I, it causes me to, to slip and, and slide down this little passageway. I'm, I'm, it's funny, like all the planets that we travel to, oh. there's always a slip and slide moment. Yes, yes. It's Regardless kind of if it's... The- I was going to yeah, say, it's, it's currently one of the trending things in gameplay mechanics, but yeah, go ahead. Yeah, exactly. Like, regardless if it's ice or mud or just you know, metal, wet metal or something, like, there's always a slip and slide moment. I'm like, not again. And so, um, <laughs> I, I, I cannot, I can, I can time some of the jumps right, but then I'll just slide right off the corner. I'm like, again, and again, and again, and again, and again, and using all my little stim, you know, packs to try and heal myself. And then I got so upset. I'm like, I'm done. I'm going to take a shower and go to bed. I can't stand it. like this. This is a, like the stupid platform aspect. And then like the next night, I'm like, okay, I'm going to try it again. And I did it. And I did the whole thing in one shot. I'm like, okay. I don't know why I was so, I couldn't do it one night. And then the, next, the following night, it was a piece of cake. I don't know. Anyhow. Yeah. So we're, let me, let me ask you a question. So the, the, did you struggle with a particular sliding sequence? Is that what you couldn't pass or was it just overall right. the level itself was just very difficult with all the different types of platform challenges? Just the sliding sequence. Okay. So this is going to make you feel better because I know the planet you're talking about and there, uh, there is like, I had the same thing happen to me where like, is it one of those prolonged sliding sequences? Right. Yeah. Okay. I know exactly what you're talking about. And it is something that has been talked about on other podcasts and um, even on Reddit and that sort of thing, where there is some kind of bug where uh, I don't know if it's like a collision detection issue or whatever it is, but like you're, you're going down that huge mudslide kind of thing. And when you jump, it's like for whatever reason, like you cannot reach the the other side you can't make it over that chasm that's there and so you just end up using up all your stem packs and then you end up dying and you have to respawn again and it is the weirdest thing but i think it's it's some sort of like detection box or collision detection box something is a miss right there and um i was honestly hoping that they would have fixed it by now just because they do have updates for that that game, and they were talking about how they were going to be uh, making some some fixes and that sort of thing. So it's unfortunate that you had to go through that, but at least you got past it. Yeah. <clears throat> so, anyhow, looking for I, I I feel like I'm getting towards the end of it. I mean my my skill tree is nearly all blossomed, so there's not much more I can learn, Russ. So I think I'm getting my I'm I'm, I'm getting to the end of it. I think I feel like I'm, I'm I feel it in in my gut. I'm getting to the end of it. Other than that, feeling, that's, that's, that's all I've been playing. What was that? I was, I was going to ask, are you feeling more badass as a Jedi? I am, but I always resort to just trying to be very skillful with my lightsaber or my light bow, whatever it is. Uh, so I always forget about the force until I think, okay, you know, I should just slow that guy down. Can I slow him down? Oh, yeah, I can. <laughs> I can. <laughs> And then, uh, yeah, so. It's true, though, because um, when I was playing the game, there were certain um, techniques or maneuvers that I really didn't utilize all that much during, like, 75% of the game. But then, all of a sudden, 
I started paying more attention to the the various skills I had unlocked in the tree. And there are a lot of force powers that really make your job easier. I mean, one, one of my favorites, have you gotten the, the ability to be able to use the force to bring someone to you? Yeah. Okay. That, that right there is, is so fun to be able to, do, to repeat that over and over. We're like, I'll just use the force. I'll pull someone to me. So they're, they're levitating in front of me and I'll just use my lightsaber and impale them. And it's just like, it's like an instant kill right there. You're like, okay, that stormtrooper has been dispatched next, you know, yeah. or like even, even the force push um, due to the amount of different places that either are on cliffs or have huge pitfalls around the surrounding area. That sort of thing is yeah. is, uh, is is pretty satisfying. Yeah, I'll definitely use the the force push when there's just uh, some annoying enemy. I don't have the patience to take him out how I want to take him out. I just force push him off. He falls and dies, and I get the experience of moving on. <laughs> Done. Speaking of the force, though, how come when you're not in a fight, you can use as much force as you want? You're just the force man. And then when you get in a fight, you can only use a little bit of force, but it doesn't really, it doesn't regenerate all that quick, Russ. How is it? Well, I think there was a creative decision that was made, which I actually agree with. I think that they probably looked at how people would be kind of experimenting in between encounters just to like kind of warm up or practice or experiment with like different things you could do with the force. And, and that would be kind of lame. Like if you're, just exploring and, and you're trying out certain things and you wind up using like a, all of your force meter up. And then all of a sudden you come across an encounter where you really could use some force and you just don't have any, I think that'd be pretty frustrating and honestly be kind of a downer too. Cause like you want those encounters, those battles to be epic. And so I, I totally am fine with, with that. Also, the other thing too is in your skill tree, there are multiple, opportunities to be able to expand your force meter so that way you can use more of it when you're in those battles. I'm not sure if, if, if you've unlocked those already. No, yeah, I've, yeah, I've, I've seen that, but, um, like if I use one move and it drains nearly half of my force meter, then it's like, okay, well, uh, I've done that and it took a fingernail of life away from the, the boss and that's it. I guess I won't be using it again. <laughs> You used the wrong force ability there, chub. <laughs> it doesn't seem to matter. And then I was trying to, I've been trying to like aim. I have the ability to throw my my lightsaber and call it back to me. And there's been times where I'm fairly close to one of these stormtroopers that has one of those electric kind of clubs. And I'll toss it to him and it'll just like fall at his feet and then come right back to me. And so I'll try to aim up. Okay, I'm going to aim up this time. Maybe I'll, I'll get him on the knees. And I'll throw it and it'll just like fall off. And it won't even, I'm like, oh, you gotta be kidding me. And this is not like a stretch. This is like the guy right in front of me. And the reason he can't come over to me is because he can't leap the distance or the little like gap because he's not programmed <laughs> to or something, right? So I'm, I'm literally like tossing it to him. He's only like a few people away, like a distance. And it just falls flat. And then I go back to the skill tree and I look at it. And the guy's like pretty far away. I'm like, this should be working just fine. I go, useless. <laughs> Anyway, you'll get it. I have faith in you. So what have you been up to, Russ? Well, I've been super busy at uh, my job, so I actually have not played or watched anything uh, this, this week. My, I did receive my Xbox in the mail due to my lovely wife who shipped it, and so this weekend I'm going to be actually getting reacquainted with, uh, with that lovely machine, but... Um, one of the things that I did think is worth noting is that um, a lot of the the major major titles that are supposed to be coming out during like about four, first quarter, I would say, um, of this year, have been delayed. And so I, I mean, it was it was kind of crazy because like I don't know if you heard, but Final Fantasy Remake has been delayed until April, and uh, Cyberpunk, of course, I think you know, has been delayed until April as well. Also, Marvel's Avengers from Crystal Dynamics was pushed back to September. So I think all three of those games originally were going to be slated for coming out right around like February, March, if I'm not mistaken. But they've been subsequently pushed back. And, and that's totally fine um, for multiple reasons for me personally. I, I, I'm 
just focusing on my new job right now. So it, for them to come out later, it's like, oh, okay, yeah, that, that'll work. I'll be able to perhaps have some some free time to be able to, to play that. But also, too, each of these titles, I think, requires the, the correct amount of TLC. And I, for one, am, am totally fine with them taking more time to make sure that they get everything right as opposed right. to rushing something out half-finished. Um, Cyberpunk is actually pushed to September. Oh, wow. They're in September now. Yeah, so it was so going to be released in April, now September. So both Cyberpunk and Avengers are uh, are pushed back to September. Wow. So third quarter. Okay. Interesting. I know that um, another thing that's worth noting is, and Steve, I can't remember. Have you, I don't think you did. Did you end up pre-ordering the, the Final Fantasy remake or not? Yes, I did. Okay. I read something on IGN that talked about how um, if you had pre-ordered that title directly from Square Enix, that uh, you need to look for an email that they have sent out because apparently, and I don't know why they have to do this, but anybody who pre-ordered the title directly through their website, um, your pre-order is no longer like active. <laughs> And so, like, there, there is a grace period where you have to go to the website before, I think, February 28th. Like, like they're giving everyone the month of February. And they, they had emailed out everyone who had originally placed a, a, a pre-order. And so all you have to do is just click on the link, and then it'll take you to the, the, the web page. And then, essentially, you have to, like, reconfirm that you are wanting to pre-order Final Fantasy VII Remake. And if you do not do that, then your pre-order is forfeit and will go to, to the next person who's like on a wait list or whoever wants to get it. So it's, it's a pretty um, eyebrow raising decision, I would say. Uh, it, I don't understand why they can't just continue the pre-orders uh, that have already been placed and move just, just, you know, Hey, just have an announcement. It's being delayed, but your pre-orders are safe. I don't know why they're, they're causing customers to have to take that step, but figured I would let you know. Cause I think for me, I ended up um, pre-ordering mine through Amazon. I'll have to double check, but um, yeah, mine was through I, Amazon. Okay. I think, I think we are okay. I don't think there has to be anything done uh, because we didn't actually go through the Square Enix website in order to pre-order the title, but uh, figure that was worth uh, sharing just because we would probably have listeners out there who may have done so. Make sure you have not one sword, but two swords. It's time for our topic of the day. Our topic of the day is the Netflix Witcher season one review. And I, w I have, I have a, a number of questions that I've been looking forward to asking you, Steve. And I've, I'm, I'm trying to figure out how to like kick things off. I guess overall high level, what did you think of season one? So I, you know, season one, I, I, I definitely liked it. I, I kind of thought that they would, take the way they were going to deliver the story a bit different because it, if you haven't read the books and I haven't read all the books and I haven't completed one yet, I've got them jumping around <laughs> to be honest. I got to like start one and then, I, and then start another one and then I kind of, anyway, whatever. So if you haven't read the books or you haven't even played the games, then you're not really going to know what's going on. You're going to get frustrated of, okay, why are they taking us back in time? There's no reason for them to do that. Okay, now we're way forward in time. Okay, why did they do that? And there's no real explanation of why they decided to tell a story like they did. So I'm okay with it because I kind of understand everything that's going on. But when uh, Wifey saw it, she's going, fill me in here. Uh, I don't know, uh, you know, just... 
why are we doing this? Um, anyway, once I filled her in and explained what was happening, she's like, okay, I love this series. It's great. But if you weren't here to tell me what's going on, I would be clueless. So that's where I kind of think it fell short. I think another part where it fell short was is uh, how they decided to uh, depict Triss. Because uh, if you're a fan of the games, Triss does not look anything like that <laughs> you're, you're going to be used to. And that well, and might I didn't have been even know the, that Triss was in the season one. Yeah, she she's I, in season one. Yeah. So she's which one is she's Triss? the person. She's the one. She's the sorceress who um let's see what was that episode? She's in episode 3. She comes to uh she meets Geralt and she's explaining the um the the curse that was put on this girl. Um, and she's also towards like the last episode you see her, like she's the one who's, uh, making all those kind of viney plants and those poisonous gases where the, that's affecting the soldiers. Um, that's Triss. That's Triss. Yes. I had no so, idea. Yeah, exactly. So, and that might be because they took, it, it might've been the author's vision of how he wanted Triss to look versus CD Projekt Red's. Triss, um, because even though CD Projekt Red, you know, they had definitely had some input on the show, they they were they took a, a step back. They were mostly just watching um, and letting everyone else do the thing. Rather as um, Andre Sapkowski, he was he's like he's one on one with the writer of the show, and he and even there's scenes with him. Like Netflix has some behind the scenes stuff where she's interviewing him and he's talking about the show and the books and whatever. And, and uh, he has a lot of creative of input. And so it might've been his vision of how he wanted Tris to look. I don't know. All I'm, all I'm thinking is that the fans of the book played the games and love the games. And so pretty much everybody who's watching um, loves the game and, I think they're okay with it, but they're both, they're all looking at it like, that's not right, but the, we still love the show, so we'll take it. But um, anyway, I think CD Projekt Red made the series successful through the game and people, more people read the books because of the game than the other way around. And so um, anyway, I think that's a bit of a letdown. But overall, I mean, Cavill does an amazing job. Cavill has said plenty of times that he loves the the, the games and he also played the games, loves the games, and therefore read the books. And it was calling Netflix saying, hey, I'm your guy. Call me. We're going to do this. You know, And he was the one really pushing for his for his part being the lead role. Netflix didn't go to him. He went to Netflix. Right. Um, so anyhow, he knew what fans wanted to see with Geralt. And I mean, he's the one doing the sword play and he's he's totally owning it for sure. Um, also, too, I mean, the series seems to be um, it's not so much about Geralt as it is about Yennefer, it seems. Not so much, I mean, there you, you have three stories. You have Siri, Geralt, Yennefer. And, and while the Siri side is, I think, a little bit weak, um, the and the Geralt and Yennefer sides are stronger. They're almost like 50-50. And so it almost seems like a, the, the show is a little more biased towards Yennefer than Geralt. Because it shows Yennefer's kind of origin story. Geralt, you already know, and say that he has no introduction. He just touches on his past a little bit. But Yennefer has this, this whole entire origin story, and it kind of follows her from her beginnings all the way up. So, anyway, I mean, that's neither here nor there. I'm not, you know, like, upset about it or anything, but I just thought it would be different. But, anyhow, um, back to you, Russ. <laughs> oh, 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 thank you. Well, I'm glad you said something about Triss, because I had no idea she was in season one. I was thinking they were holding her back for season two and they would have some sort of uh, big reveal of everyone's favorite redhead from the Witcher series. But uh, yeah, I, I can see how the author of the Witcher will be opinionated in his own way. And he has every right to, because he's the one who created the world. I, I it, it's one of those, those interesting situations where on the one hand, the author has a vision of what their world should look like, what their character should look like. But at the same time, we as gamers, like you said, we were introduced to a, a world ourselves that we fell in love with that was in large part in sync with 
what the author had created, but they did perhaps take some creative license or whatever to change up some of the things. I don't know. But my thing is, is I'm, I agree with you. I think that um, I think most of the fans who are wanting to watch the Witcher come from the, the gaming world. And so they're expecting their characters to, to kind of remain true, I guess you could say. Yeah. Um, having said that though, I, mean, I do think that, that this TV show will in fact bring in more fans and create more fans of the Witcher who don't play games oh, to, to them. They're not going to yeah. care. They're going to be like, Oh, okay. You know, they'll, they'll, they'll take it in because it's, it's their first exposure to this world. That's actually already happened. So, um, According to GameSpot, uh, after this uh, this this series was released, <laughs> oh, uh, two hundred more copies of The Witcher have been sold, and Steam has seen the most activity on The Witcher it's ever seen uh, after this series was out. So, I mean, there's been a, a rekindled <laughs> interest in The Witcher. I mean, it sold more copies basically uh, at the end of 2019 than it did on launch day. So. I mean, it's awesome. definitely rekindled something. Yeah, for sure. But also, too, you got to think, you got to know that um, with the CD Projekt Red and Andre Sapkowski lawsuit that had happened, the result of that lawsuit was that CD Projekt Red would still retain all the rights to their Witcher merchandise and like creative everything. Um, and so uh, CD Projekt Red and Mr. Sapkowski did come to an agreement and he did get paid something. It wasn't what he set out to get paid, but. Um, the, the relationship was maintained. And so, um, it's in Sapkowski's interest to make this good because he is still has a relationship with CD project red and all those details. I haven't figured out. I I'm, I've been searching, but I, I, I think it, that's pretty classified. I don't know. I can't, I'm not, not able to find a lot of the, the, the details. Um, but for example, Geralt and the books is a lot more, vocal like he, he talks a lot more and in the games he doesn't he's more like quiet he'll he'll talk and chat when he has to but every word is very important he's just not going to blabber on and that's the same thing like in the movie where Daryl doesn't really want to talk to anybody and if he does he's not looking for a long conversation he's just looking to basically answer your question so um i mean there's a couple different scenes i think when he's talking to roach or i think in the the one the first or second uh uh show i think he has some long conversation with somebody but other than that um the Geralt you see in the show is mostly the Geralt you see in the game right and i for one um really did also enjoy henry cavill's performance as as Geralt of rivia you know i i think that that henry did such a wonderful job i think that um i really can't picture anybody else performing this character and honestly i think that uh, like most of the other characters um had wonderful actor counterparts i, I think Jennifer. you know it's surprising because again the actress that was that played as Jennifer, she she has certain facial structure qualities and that sort of thing that do remind me of the game character but at the same time there are other types of of elements that are a little bit of a departure, but really, I mean, I think that, that they found someone who could really do a, a good job playing the, the character of Unifer. what do you think? I thought so too, as far as her appearance goes, I thought the voice was wrong. Uh, if you listen to like, if you just YouTube some texts by Unifer, whatever, some scenes from the Witcher three by with Unifer, uh, Unifer has a more mature, slower speech. Uh, not not slow speech, but she doesn't speak to the pace that the actress who plays Unifer in the show does. Um, and her pitch is also much higher, like, oh, Geralt, da, 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 ba, 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 ba. you know, and worse is in the game. It's, Geralt, why do you do this? So you slept with my friend sort of thing. That's the more of the pace. Uh, and so it, it's, again, just nitpicking, but... Um, I mean, they they did give her the purple the eyes. They did uh, mention the the lilac and gooseberries, <laughs> you know. And I think they did get her her costumes right. Uh, so I mean, I think they they did hit some some nails on the head. But I mean, they could have done better. Yeah, I kind of want to see who else maybe tried out for the part, possibly. But uh, I mean, I, you know, that's neither here nor there. 
I really do love her outfits. I think that her outfits were, were very appropriate for the, the Unifer character. And actually, uh, Geralt w- was spot on, I thought, too. It makes me look forward to seeing it, whether or not they're going to introduce some of the, the more epic armor suits and, and uh, I don't even know what you call it, but just, just different pieces of armor that you could find in the game. It'd be really cool if, like, perhaps in season two, three, four, or five, you know, we get to see him either come across those those outfits or we just see him wearing them because they're they're all really cool when it comes to siri now okay so i i for the first three or four episodes i was not aware that that the girl who was playing siri was in fact siri and at first i thought it was a bit of a departure but then as i watched more episodes I could see in certain angles of her face and the way she was acting that she could, in fact, um, bear a pretty close resemblance to the game character of Siri, especially if she were to have her hair cut just like how Siri's hair looked in, in uh, Witcher 3. And especially if, if, like, you know, if it turned gray and that sort of thing. So I'm, I'm looking forward to it. And I actually think the girl who is playing as Siri, I think she's got some acting chops. I, I really did feel for her situation. I think that she had a nice range to um, her performance. And so I think that moving forward, especially if this turns into something that lasts for five or eight seasons, we're going to see her mature and grow. And then perhaps they'll just kind of dole out her character arc as we move forward. What do you think? No, I, I agree. I, I would think, I I think what's going to happen maybe in the next season is they're going to maybe hone her ability uh, or her magic or whatever. Cause in this one, it's almost like an emotional, um, uh, she can't know. manipulate it. She can't control it. She can't control it. It's only when she's just on, on the peak of, of fear or anger that she lashes out and then something happens that she or doesn't survival. know what yeah. her survival instinct kicks in. Yeah. Um, so I think this, uh, maybe the next season they'll, they'll hint on Geralt teaching her how to hone, hone her, her strengths. But, uh, no, I mean her fit, her face definitely, uh, I could, I could see it for sure. She needs a yeah. scar. They actually, they both need a scar on their eye, Russ. Both Geralt and Siri do at some point. Well, and, and I think that what you just said is, uh, I don't know, it gives us the opportunity to kind of segue a bit into the the overall plot of season one. Um, and, and for me, I think I mentioned this last week when we were talking about um, how we wanted to, to cover this for this week. I, I have not played Witcher one and two. I've only played Witcher three. And so I am kind of in the, the weeds, I guess you could say when I watched this, the season, because there really wasn't anything from Witcher three that I could kind of call upon. And so I wasn't sure if, if what we were watching was in fact from the games or if this was just actually completely an original take uh, to the characters and that sort of thing while maintaining perhaps some kind of structured outline with the relationships of Nilfgaard and the other kingdoms and that sort of thing. I mean, do you, do you have any knowledge of that? Yeah. So the, so the Witcher one and the Witcher two were very, to my understanding, very close to uh, the books. Witcher three was more of a combination of CD projects, red um, outlook of the story and the characters uh, they already had like the the land and the overall like w- what they wanted to do and and uh, and the backstory. So it was a combination of elements that had happened in and some of the stories and the books versus what CD Projekt Red wanted to do with the game. So what this what what the show is doing is it's basically taking some short stories from a uh, couple of the books, um, The Last Wish and Sword of Destiny, if I'm not mistaken. So anyhow. Um, yeah, that's why you're not, you're not seeing like remnants of the Witcher three specifically is because that mostly came that ha- at least half of that came from CD project red, not from, um, uh, Mr. Sapkowski. So, um, versus the show that's pretty much all coming from the author and written by, um, what's her name? Um, his, his, Hisrich or Hisrich, uh, Lauren Hisrich. She's writer on Netflix. Um, 
Anyhow, so it's coming from her and him, but not necessarily from CD Projekt Red. Although I, I did, you know, I, I read something and I've been trying to find the article again. I read something where they had consultants from CD Projekt Red, which would make sense. Um, but then I couldn't find the article again. So I don't know, maybe it was wrong or something. But uh, I remember, I say, I think one of the names was Thomas Baginski. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. Anyway, I read that well, regard- once. I was, I was yeah. just going to uh, jump in and just say, regardless of um, of where the story comes from, I do think that it is enjoyable to see this go on because I think in terms of the world of The Witcher, there are all kinds of different scenarios that can go on. I think my main thing is just making sure that they maintain the character relationships, the dynamics of, of, of the different characters, as well as kind of like the different massive threats that are coming that ultimately serve as like a vehicle for uniting certain characters together or having these temporary alliances, that sort of thing. I think it's probably not too much to ask in terms of like, you know, if we can just adhere to those kind of basic building blocks regarding the plot, and then they can also weave in some things that perhaps they, they were been interested in or, or think that it'll, it'll be fun to do. You know, one one part that was confusing to me since I hadn't finished all the books is that uh, when they basically tell you where Siri came from, it's not what the game said. I mean, if you play the game, Siri is the daughter of Emperor Emir from Nilfgaard. And like the whole Witcher 3, Nilfgaard is after Siri because they want, well, not after her, like they want to kill her, but I mean, they're. Emir tells Geralt, go find Siri, which is the main reason he's going to find her because she needs to be, she's heir to the throne and she needs to take over Nilfgaard. Right, Versus right. in this, you know, she's born to somebody else and, um, you know, that somebody else has powers and whatever, whatever, whatnot. But I mean, unless the person she's born from does become later the emperor of Nilfgaard, we won't know. But, um, anyhow, the way they, they show that, I, it kind of took me aback for a second. Like, no, Nilfgaard is something. Some, separate, you know, army right now. I don't see that connection, but you know, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, and I, moving on to, um, just the, the cinematography and visual effects of, of the show. Uh, I was actually impressed. I, I, I did enjoy the, the different environments that, that they were filming in. And I, I approve of how they, they managed to, to take on the, the different battle sequences. I was very impressed with, like you said, with Henry Cavill's use of the sword and, and everything. It felt very Witcher, if that makes any sense. Yeah. Which I, which I think right. is cool because th- his style of fighting and even the combat mechanics in the game are unique to that particular world. It's not like your, your classic Renaissance here, let's have a, a duel to the death kind of thing. It's it's much more uh, brutal, I guess you could say, and, and quick. Yeah. Well, I think that actually comes from uh, Cavill, who knows what the fans are going to want to see, and it comes from Sapkowski. Um, but I, I'll have you know, Russ, um, Alec uh, Sakharov is one of the cin- cinematographers I'd have you know. And he's done oh. work on Game of Thrones, Ozark, oh. House of Cards, and uh-huh. the Sopranos. So the guy's got a uh, nice repertoire. repertoire. Uh-huh. Ah, very nice. Well, kudos to him then. And it's, it, it just is a, a treat for us fans then because that's, yeah, we, we, we want, the, I know, I, I can speak for myself. I definitely want the, the world to seem larger than life. I don't want it to seem like, oh, we were on a budget and we, this is all we could do. And, and it doesn't feel like that at all. It, it definitely, when, you, when you're watching it, it's like, man, okay, this, is, this has these exotic locales and even the, the way that they've framed and they've done the color grading on it, um, I think it, it's very fitting. Um, I, for one, am looking forward to season two. I want there to be more fights with monsters. Uh, just because that was a, a, such a staple in Witcher 3. Granted, you have different types of, of interactions with pe- with the people of the different kingdoms and the lands and that sort of thing, and you had the, these weird types of relationships form, and that's all well and good, but I have always really enjoyed how the Witcher's sole purpose of his occupation is to hunt down these like crazy exotic creatures. And we, you know, we, we kind of saw it here and there a little bit, 
in season one, but um, my hope is is that it just had to do with budget constraints. I think that that since it's been a big success, I think that as they go into season two, they'll probably have more money to spend on visual effects. Yeah, I mean, I think the way they were going to approach it this time was either they're going to lay the groundwork for the characters that fans are going to want to see, or it's just going to be a bunch of action with you know sword play and monsters and. I mean, what do, what do you choose? They're both kind of good options. You either go the slower route and you build the characters, which is important, or you just go to the, the action route where it's just a bunch of monsters, CG, sword play, hacking and slashing guts. I mean, I mean that's a big part of it. That's the whole toss a coin to your Witcher, I mean, you know, to take care of this problem. Um, <laughs> you know, a problem of a monster or some somebody who's cursed or, you know, whatever. That's the whole point. And uh, actually but, a question I have about Yennefer going back to her really quick. Is it accurate to the games that she used to be like really badly transfigured? Like, like she just had a lot of uh, physical ailments and then there was some kind of wizard or someone who was able to make her gorgeous. Is that too true to the game or is that something that they decided to take creative license on? I don't think that's true to the game. I think that's part of the story. Actually, I, I saw something about that right before we started the podcast. And I went, I went oh, I've been looking for that. And then I didn't get a chance to uh, to read it um, when <laughs> <laughs> before we had to start. Oh, so oh, oh, oh. I anyway, I think something. And now yeah. <laughs> Russ. Yeah, you had that never ending you- story take your attention away. You're like, ah, the horse is <laughs> drowning. <laughs> <laughs> what did you think something. of what Sorry, go ahead okay. go ahead yeah what did yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> what? What you think of uh dandelion oh man i loved him i thought he was great i um i figured that was dandelion he again he looks slightly different from the game in the game he has like a little mustache and other stuff right. and again i'm playing Witcher 3, or I've played Witcher 3. I have not played the first two, so it could be that his look is is different in the first two titles. But no, I thought he was awesome. I loved his personality. I loved his delivery. I thought that his relationship with Geralt was perfect. And especially considering um, the kind of personality type that Geralt has, where he's very emotionless, and but still has like a strong... Um, sense of fairness and duty and protection, that sort of thing. Uh, right. I thought that that, that was actually, that was one of the high points of the show, honestly, for, for me. And, right. I, and, honest, and I, I mean, when I think of Yennefer and Geralt, I do think that their relationship also was very close to kind of the, the dynamics that I, I witnessed in the game. So I think that that's really cool. I would say the only thing that I, that when, from a character standpoint, I think Triss, I think that that my my opinion is I really want Triss to look like how she looked in the game because I thought that they did such a great job with the art direction of the character. I love the fact that she was a redhead and that um, the way she dressed and handled herself and and she she had more of that um, not carefree but but kind of more of that lighthearted personality right. as opposed to Yennefer who's a lot more um, deep, if you will, yeah. much more intense. Um, I will give you a couple nuggets here, Russ. Um, so I like you nuggets. Might- <laughs> so <laughs> especially chicken nuggets. So the so dandelion is not named dandelion, which is probably you know why that's that you figured that was him, but you didn't know for sure is because his name was Jasker, which um, in the story he's not in in the. In the Polish version of the story, he's not named Dandelion. That got sent over with translation because he he is named after a flower, like a yellow flower, but they didn't know how to translate it when the books came over here. And so it's named him Dandelion, which that's what the name we got in um, the books, or excuse me, in the games. But the, the his name in the show is his name in the book. But that's why, anyway, but I prefer him, the way he looks uh, in the show versus the game. I thought the game kind of looked like a weirdo. But um, also with Yennefer uh, in that, in the show where she's trying to take control of the djinn and Geralt has the wish Mm -hmm. that they also, remember how in the, in the, in the third game, how you play this little sequence where Yennefer says, 
you know, we have this relationship, but I don't know if it's true or not because of that wish right, that you right, right. wish for the gin. So I did a little bit of digging and um, it's ba- Geralt basically wished during that scene here. I mean, he says, I just want sleep, but I, in the book, he wishes something that's basically bonding the, the gin or excuse me, bonding Yennefer to him. And what that means is the djinn could not, in a sense, uh, kill or corrupt Yennefer because it could not kill and corrupt its master. And since Geralt found him and brought him out, he was the djinn's master. And bonding Yennefer to him, that meant that the, that the, the djinn, with killing Yennefer, would also kill Geralt. And so because that was his wish... He saved Unifer's life, which is basically what he wanted to do. But there could have been something else with the wish that that basically, um, you know, made made her fall in love with him or made him fall in love with her. But they both fall in love with each other. So that's why that's how we progressed from there to like the the, the Witcher three game is that she's going. You know, that's you wish this, and I don't even know if it's true. But I don't even know what you wish. But that I know something changed around then, and that's what I want to look into. Anyway, there you go. Thank you for that. That makes a lot of sense. And I actually, I did pick up a bit on that. I did think about the game, how there's that sequence where she talks about how she doesn't know if her love for Geralt is real or if it's like fa- a fabrication from a, some sort of magical spell or something like that. And so, yeah, I, I really appreciated the nod in the show to, to the game in, in that regard. Did you have any uh, closing thoughts about the show? Um, you know, it's, it's doing wildly successful. Um, the numbers show it. I mean, um, Lauren Hisrich has plans for seven seasons. I don't know if we'll get there, but I hope they oh, just continue wow. the trend. Um, I mean, if you look really hard at what they were showing, like in, like in the last episode and whatnot, um, they do kind of drop little bits and pieces of what may happen later on in the seasons. Um, And I mean, I think they have a good formula. I think if they don't become political with it, then it's going to stay good. Um, You know, I was going to ask you, uh, oh, by the way, have have you heard all the renditions done to uh, the song Toss a Coin to Your Witcher? I don't think so. There's been a ton of people who have their own spin on it or just use their own voice and it sounds great. I mean, it'll get stuck in your head. It's a great song. And um, on the PC version of The Witcher 3, they actually, there's a mod you can get where, um, in one of the chapters where Dandelion plays for a crowd of people, he plays a song, but the mod ends up being toss a coin to your witcher instead of the song he would originally sing in the game. <laughs> so I thought that was kind of cool. Um, I didn't say, they hadn't said it's for the console versions yet, but it's definitely for the PC version. You can get it. Um, anyhow, um, what episode would you say you liked the best? I remember you asked me that last week and I was going through the episodes. It's very difficult for me to know for sure. I, I, I mean, I will say I do think the one episode that has them hunting the dragon and, and the, the guy who is um, who, who had hired Geralt is in fact the dragon. I think that that, that particular episode was pretty cool. Um, honestly, I think that the, they did, they did such a good job weaving the episodes together that it's very, it's very difficult to really ascertain like, Oh, I like this episode more than the other episode simply because uh, I think part of it has to do with their playing with like certain scenes that happened in the past versus present day and how they don't really make a conscious effort to like really say, Oh, you know, 10 years ago or whatever that they don't inform the viewer of like, Hey, this is a, um, a sequence that's happening there. So it's, it's very lucid if you, if you think about like how each episode kind of has a combination of, of events that, that they will spontaneously jump to that are in the past. And all of a sudden then they'll yank you back to the present. And so I found myself having to try and figure out like what I'm watching at any given point in time. And so, because I was kind of a sponge in that regard, I don't really have like a, a, an episode that, that I'm just like, Oh, this is like, my favorite episode, but do you, do you have a favorite episode? Episode three. I love it. I mean, that was everything that the whole series is about. It's about, I mean, Geralt 
he doesn't care how prestigious or or powerful you are. He's paid to do a job. He's going to get to it. And evil, you know, he, they keep on saying evil is evil no matter where it comes from. I mean, it, it doesn't matter if you're a monster or a human. If you have evil intentions and you do evil works, you're, you're kind of, you, you fit the definition. And it's him doing this discovery with the king of uh, figuring out, okay, why is it that you feel this way and everyone else feels that way? And then he's discovering with someone else who puts this curse on this, on this uh, creature, in a sense, that the monster is not really the problem. You're the problem. And all you guys want me to do is kill the monster. This monster is actually a human put under a curse by you because you were jealous and didn't want anyone else to have you know, relations with one person. You're the issue. You're the problem, not the monster. I can make the monster go away um, the right way. Um, and that's what he, what he does. I mean, he lifts the curse, you know, it nearly costs him his life, but, um, he, he does what the right thing is, not what everyone else perceives or perceives the right thing to be done. You know what I mean? Like he figures out what I just, I just loved it. I love all about it. And, um, even the whole thing with, uh, with Unifer when she, um, be, you know, when she basically is reformed into this, beauty she becomes she's like the ugly duckling who became a swan and that whole sequence where she goes against um you know the the uh, the brotherhood i guess of, of sorcerers and gets paired up with the king that she wants to get paired up with and not who they were going to assign her to and she like takes control i don't know that whole episode was was epic yeah that was really cool yeah i, I would say overall for me um in conclusion i think that that I'm really happy that Netflix decided to take a chance on an unknown property like the Witcher with gaming. Um, we, we as gamers already know what the world is of the Witcher is about. And so we get excited, but there are many people out there who don't play games. And so to them, when they open up Netflix and they're, they're checking out some of the, the new shows, they look at it and they think, what the heck is this? I think that uh, it was a risk that I think has paid off really well. And I think Moving forward, as long as they can um, continue to improve upon the the plot itself, because I do think there is a bit of a danger in how the waters were a bit muddied with going back and forth in time with, with a, a past episode, or not a past episode, but like a, a past event that transpired that somehow has influenced what's going on, where Geralt is at, or where any of the characters are at in present day. I think there needs to be a little more mindfulness when it comes to just appropriately letting folks know, hey, this sequence is is happening in the past and that sort of thing, because otherwise it can get um, a little confusing, but it's not, it's not by any stretch bad. And I do like what they're setting up so far. It, it does make me curious to see how they continue to expand the world and I want to see, um, you know, some, some new characters that get introduced. I want to see some of Geralt's kin uh, that he's friends with, that he interacts with. I want to see him actually go to Rivia so we get to see what it looks like. I want to see more of the, the relationship with Triss. I do hope that they, they kind of go back and they do a bit of a redesign with Triss. Just, again, that's just me being selfish. I just, I really loved uh, the art direction from the game. And I, I really want to see it more closely resemble that, but hats off uh, to Netflix for, for taking a chance on this. And uh, I'm just, I'm glad I have been able to sit back and listen to you be able to inform all of us, Steve, about the different <laughs> intricacies and ins and outs. I actually had no idea that you read the, the Witcher books. I think that's really cool. So that wraps up this episode of Joygasm. Make sure you tune in next week. Thanks for hanging out with us. If you enjoyed this episode, we invite you to check out patreon.com slash joygasm, which is spelled J-O-Y-G-A-S-M, and consider becoming a monthly contributor. You'll get exclusive perks and early access to the show, not to mention it really helps us continue doing what we love to do. Also, you can follow us on social media and YouTube. Just do a search for Joygasm TV. Last but not least, search Joygasm TV on Twitch because you might just see us stream our gaming adventures live. And until then, we will see you next week.